Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. If you've seen our first two webinars on the public markets, publicly traded REIT markets, welcome if this is your first webinar. My name is David Shear. I'm co-CEO of Origin Investments. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. It's a volatile day in the markets. It's been volatile for the last few months as everyone processes a lot of new information, obviously, about what's going on in the economy. I'm happy that I'm joined here by our portfolio manager of publicly traded REITs, Jeff Shaver. Um, what we're going to do today is um, cover um, a lot of information that's shared regularly at conferences and at just analyst calls um, on public REITs where management teams and CEOs report their quarterly earnings. Um, there's conferences called NAREIT. Um, I actually attended uh, the one in LA last November with Jeff, but obviously the conference this year was virtual as all of them are. Um, what we do at Origin um, is we trade uh, and invest both in publicly traded REITs in our portfolios. We're an active portfolio manager on the public side, and then we're also um, heavily involved in the private markets. And we think that there's a huge benefit in seeing everything um, in U.S. real estate, which we do. Um, and so we can determine what the best relative value is. Um, right now, um, it, it's particularly important to see both and be in tune in both. And so I think you're going to glean a lot of new information um, from what we discussed today. So I'm super excited um, to talk with Jeff about this. Now, one bit of housekeeping, if you're not um, a veteran, um, if this is your first time, if, if you hit the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A function. Um, this, this time, I'm going to make it a little bit different. Um, Jeff um, has been covering... Uh, public U.S. REITs for over 15 years. Um, his knowledge base is um, astonishing, actually. Um, and so I, I would welcome anyone to ask any question they want when we get to Q&A about any publicly traded REIT, um, management team, balance sheet, um, what his opinion is on the sector, growth rate, et cetera. Um, get granular because um, he can do it and there's, there's nothing like live to uh, put him on the spot. Um, if you don't ask some questions, I'll, I'll lob in some myself, but hopefully that's not necessary. And, and so with that, let's jump right in, Jeff. And let's keep it to U.S. Let's keep it to any U.S. listed REIT. That's right. Um, U.S. REITs, because that, that's what we cover, um, both on the private side and the public side, by the way, um, only U.S. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in. Jeff, I participated on um, a few of the, uh, the NAREIT. Uh, conference calls, in particular the multifamily ones. I know that you did um, an awful lot of conference calls via this um, conference. So why don't you take through first high level? I, I believe you saw some themes that emerged. Yeah, no, overall, I mean, I think it was relatively uh, a, a positive outlook from people. I, I think, and we'll, we'll see some of this in some of the themes, uh, you know, that the panic selling has subsided. Uh, you know, the, the economy is starting to reopen. Different states, different municipalities are, are at different places. Uh, but, but every location, uh, you know, has plans to, to reopen in the future. And as more, um, you know, commerce gets done, whether it's business to business or, or consumers buying things, that generally everything, uh, you know, should, in, should improve. Obviously, the job loss uh, is, is, is startling. Then again, I guess you had the, the job number last week, whether you believe it or not, is a, is a different story. Uh, but it does seem to be that the economy is, is generally stabilizing. Management teams ge generally had a, uh, a, a better outlook than they would uh, on their first quarter earnings, or excuse me, on their second quarter earnings, call, excuse me, first quarter earnings call that happened just, you know, perhaps a month ago. So even, even within a month, management teams are starting to feel better. You, you still have some sectors, you know, such as lodging and retail, where they're in the bunker, uh, they're deferring capital expenditures, deferring uh, or, or postponing or eliminating headcount, trying to reduce uh, expenses. But, but even their views are generally more positive than they were, you know, a month or two ago. Right. So let's focus in and drill down on uh, rent collection because that's been discussed a lot. If the people on this particular webinar have been watching our private market webinars or even some of our fund webinars, uh, Fund 3, QOZ Fund, uh, Income Plus Fund, this always comes up. So what are you seeing in terms of rent collections in the publicly traded REITs? 
Right. Yeah. And we we wrote an article about this. Uh, that was about the April rent collections that you can find on the Path by Origin. Uh, dot com website. Uh, if you head over there and and go to the uh, insights section, you can see our April rent uh, uh, collections. Uh, but what we did see uh, was that in May, uh, rent collections. I mean, kind of varied by sector, but they were very similar to 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 April. Some sectors did a little bit better. Some did a little bit uh, worse. If you can see this the screen that I I'm showing here, here's some numbers from Navy. You know, initially it looked like May was coming in a little softer, but these numbers are, you know, as of uh, you know, a week ago. So for the April collections, you've had, you know, an extra 30, 31 days uh, to collect than you have for, for May. And, you know, it, it's pretty strong in an industrial, you know, apartments pushing up against, you know, 95%. You know, one, one takeaway that I think we do have is everyone is reporting this metric a little bit differently. You know, th there's no accounting standards for how much did you collect in April or, or May. Some people include deferrals, some do not. Um, you know, the one challenging section, and we pointed this out in the April collection piece, uh, was that you know, retail was doing the, the worst. Uh, and while you could say maybe that's getting better in May, one definite trend that we're seeing is as these retail stores uh, start to open, uh, they're they're paying their rent. They're paying. They're becoming current on uh, you know next month's rent, uh, which you know, June at this point, uh, and they're also catching up on on back rents. They're striking deals with their landlords. Uh, they know if they're going to tend to keep the stores open, they've they've got to pay their rent. So you know June June's probably going to be a tough tough month. Probably not that different from May, but generally going forward, the amount of rent that landlords collect from their tenants should be improving. Um, you know, I, I guess I would wonder on the apartment side if we don't see jobs, you know, bounce uh, like we did last week. If they don't continue to grow, I mean, will people still be able to to pay their apartments? And I don't you know, Dave. You know, we own a lot of apartments on the private side. Do you guys have any trends into into the June collections? Yeah, that's what's interesting, right? Again, I mentioned um, we see a lot because we're a large private investor, but we also cover all the public markets. And Jeff's knowledge is is significant on that side. And so, but on the private side, um, we've tracked almost to the T, the national standard, I mean, at the REIT level. You were publishing 94 to 95 in April and May. That's where we've been too. Um, in terms of June, um, as of yesterday, when I met with our investment management team, uh, yesterday morning, we were in the low 80s, which sounds like it's worse, but, but the reality is um, the rent comes in all month. And so we're tracking where we were in April and May. So I believe it'll be similar, 94 to 95 again. Um, what's going to be a really important month is July, and well, really July and August, because um, the unemployment, um, $600 a month subsidy that's part of the, um, the fiscal stimulus expires at the end of July if they don't renew it, right? And so it's kind of like a double if then. If, the economy doesn't strengthen. And if that isn't extended, I think it's gonna be difficult, not just for multi, but for all rent collection, because you've actually removed you know, what amounts to um, $2,400 a month of free cash for people who've been displaced by coronavirus, right? So um, I personally, by the way, this is my opinion, uh, it's not even origins, it's mine. I don't think you'll get a double if. Um, I think it's more like, either the economy is going to improve or they're going to extend that benefit. I think Congress will act in a bipartisan way to do that um, because it, in my opinion, it's, it's the right thing to do, number one, but, but it's also the, it, it's, it makes the most political sense for them to do that on both sides. Like I, I wouldn't want to be on the other side of not extending unemployment benefits if unemployment is still 15% in mid-July. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, it, it, it's the, it's apartments. I I I wonder about, and it is going to be tied to you know whether uh, people are getting funds or whether the, the jobs come back. On on the commercial side, you know, it does seem like the office tenants are going to be paying the retailers if they want to open up stores. They got to pay you know, bankruptcies. That's another bit we'll talk about retail later on. Uh, but on the commercial side, it seems like people are going to start paying uh, their rents. Yeah. And it's interesting what you said in terms of now that retail is opening, 
and commerce is starting, the retailers themselves are all of a sudden motivated to pay rent, right? When they were all shuttered, you know, and they're not even sure when it reopens, it's, there's no urgency. Now they actually care if no one wants to get evicted when they're doing business, right? And so I, I think you'll see those uptick. Um, but candidly, Jeff, when I saw your, your slide, that seemed higher than what I would expect out of retail. Even the collections looking back, right? Because it's not what I've, um, it's not necessarily what I've witnessed because we don't really own retail, but it, it's what I've participated in a lot of um, CEO calls and, and with various uh, real estate organizations that own it. And it's just not what I've heard um, in terms of collections, shopping centers, I've, I've heard are anywhere from 30 to 35% freestanding i mean that seems all of it seems high to me yeah well now freestanding there's a lot of national retailers uh in there there's some big chains that have the wherewithal one interesting stat that did come out that really applies to, to retail is that through this pandemic shutdown uh the companies or the the, the renters that didn't pay their rent uh, it, it didn't matter whether they had an investment grade or were non-rated. It didn't matter if they were a national or a mom or pop, but there was a direct correlation. If your facilities were closed, you were less likely to pay rent than if you were open. So, you know, the shopping centers at 45. Hey, there's a lot of grocery stores uh, in, in that group uh, that were open the, the, the whole time. Some restaurants, maybe they only had carry out or pizza delivery, uh, yeah. but they were still open. You know, a lot of the nail salons, some of the smaller stuff was shut, but there was still a lot of stuff that was open and indeed did still pay rent during, during these past right. few months. And, and then all of this about rent collection relates to the, you know, to the balance sheet and then the ability to pay debt. Um, at Origin, we don't use a lot of debt. And so when we're collecting 94% of rent, that's plenty of rent, way more than we need to pay debt. But if you collect 94% of the rent and you're at 90% leverage, you have a problem, right? And, and, and by the way, no matter if you have any debt and you're only collecting 45%, right? Like some of these shopping centers, you can't, you can't service your debt, right? So these are the types of things that Jeff spends a lot of his time on. So like later, and I encourage you to do this, when you ask questions about specific stocks, He's going to talk about it in, on a secular basis, like meaning is this an area that he wants to invest in broadly? And he's going to talk about management teams and he's going to talk about balance sheets. And when he's talking about balance sheets, he, he's saying, look, do they have a balance sheet that can weather a storm? Because we don't know how long coronavirus is going to last and, and if there's a second wave and all these things. But um, if you have a great management team and a great balance sheet, you can actually emerge stronger because a lot of the weaker competition is eliminated and then you have pricing power. And so please ask your questions because these are the types of things that um, more than ever in the public markets, you need active management. It, it isn't enough to just say, hey, I wanna be in the public markets. I mean, it, it's pretty scary out there and it, it helps to have somebody that really understands this stuff. Um, Jeff, do you wanna, um, do you want to move on to uh, vacation and tourism? Yeah, industry? sure. So the, you know, the, the next major trend that uh, we're seeing, and this is kind of a fun one, um, you know, vacations are going to be to drive to destinations for now. And, and you, we really feel this is going to continue you know, through the end of, of 2020. This is going to persist into parts of 2021. Whether this is you know, permanent or not, uh, it, it's definitely something to pay attention to uh, in, in the near term. I mean, we're talking about a conference that generally we would have been at in person, uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't go to. We couldn't fly to, to New York City. You know, people are not flying anywhere. And, you know, I guess even before we talk about vacations, when we first see, uh, you know, hotels start to reopen, what you're going to see is solo business travelers, people, you know, traveling by themselves because they've got to take care of a deal, you see some assets or, or, or do some business. You're not going to see the large conventions, the large uh, group meetings happening. I um, mean, it's kind of the same thing in, in vacation. People don't want to fly anywhere. Uh, we, you know, they're packing people up in cars, renting RVs, and, and, and hitting the road. And so when you think about what type of real estate that you want to own, at least in this near term, you know, think that, you know, people probably aren't flying to New York City, international travel to the U.S. It, it, it's going to be down. Hawaii, you can't drive there. It's going to suffer. 
Um, you know, I mentioned Las Vegas, right? Las Vegas, they opened up this past weekend and it actually seemed like there was pretty solid demand, but you're not gonna have the convention. You're not gonna have all the parties that uh, you, you, you typically do because people are still hesitant to travel. Yeah, I just mentioned uh, Las Vegas and I do wanna point out, there are some REITs that uh, own casino assets that they lease to casino operators. And I would caution people against using those casino REITs as a proxy for the health of the Las Vegas market. Many of the casinos that some of the, many of the casinos these REITs own uh, are not always in Las Vegas. They might be regional gaming centers, which are already open and that people were driving to on a regular basis uh, beforehand. Also, their leases are structured as triple net leases with the operators. And it was kind of surprising through these past uh, few months, the casino REITs actually had some of the largest uh, percentage rent collections uh, because their operators, you know, the MGMs of the world had to keep paying rent. Uh, but, you know, think about, you know, where are people going to go? Will they drive to the Great Lakes regions? You know, sure, right? There's people in, uh, there's obviously some international travel to Chicago. But people come from, you know, Illinois, or excuse me, they come from Wisconsin, uh, you know, Missouri, Ohio. They drive here as, as a destination. Places like, you know, Myrtle, Myrtle Beach. Um, you know, think about the hotels that are near some of these beaches or places that uh, people can go to. You think about some of the retail assets. So Brookfield Property Partners, a REIT, uh, owns Fashion Show in New York City, in, excuse me, in Las Vegas, and they own Ala Moana in Honolulu. Those are two places that are probably going to see less people uh, going to do you know, retail shopping as compared to, uh, I'm not sure that the outlets are going to bounce back in its entirety, but I'll mention, you know, Tanger, ticker SKT, owns two in the Myrtle Beach area, two in the Hilton Head area. Those are going to be some hot destination areas this year. And I would almost say I would think these, these drive-by uh, outlet centers will probably do better than an Ala Moana in Honolulu uh, this year. That being said, one of the other trends that uh, we're seeing in, in vacations is there's a preference for outdoor activity uh, versus indoor activity. People would probably rather be at the, at the uh, beach or at a water park uh, rather than being inside uh, shopping. Uh, RV sales. Let me see if I can uh, show you a, a chart here of a uh, to RV manufacturers, um, Thor Industries and, and, and Winnebago. Uh, these guys, you know, yeah, they took their hits in March when the market sold off. Um, and even to after the past few days sell off, these guys are still up 20% year to date for Winnebago, 40% uh, you know, stock appreciation uh, for Thor Industries. Um, you know, you buy these things or you rent these things, there's only so many places you can take them. It, you know, it's usually a campground or, a, or, or an RV resort. Um, I don't know, do we want to talk about what your business park, partner, Michael, is doing for vacation this year? Because I, I find it's really interesting. Yeah, uh, two things, Jeff. One, uh, great point on, on national travel. The other thing that you have to consider is, um, you know, because I live in downtown Chicago, um, with everything that's going on with, with the marches, um, that's another wrinkle. It's coronavirus plus that. and you know, it, it's difficult to get around on the weekends in downtown Chicago right now. Um, it's very, very hard. Um, I believe the trains were shut for three or four days and, and then they reopened them, but not all of them. And the highways have largely been, um, you can drive on them, but you can't get on and off them. Uh, so so the, it, it, there's just so much going on that affect behavior right now in terms of travel. Um, in terms of um, RVs, you know, this is just fascinating uh, because, you know, the number one thing in, in investing in the short run, and to be clear, I'm not a short run investor and neither is Jeff. Um, we're big believers in, in longer term investment and portfolio investment. I mean, that's what he does. He runs all of Origin's public portfolios, which are actively managed, meaning he can swap in and out of stock in a particular portfolio. He does rebalancing. He does tax loss harvesting. This is a long term strategy. However, when we're talking about particular stocks, which we are right now, um, one of the things that you, you really should do um, if you wanted to do shorter term investment is you need to really pick your head up and think about where people are spending their time. Literally, where do people spend their time? And so about six weeks ago, my partner 
who's never been in an RV in his life. Um, you know, I was talking to him about business and he's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm taking a trip with my family and we rented this luxury RV. He's literally on it right now. He, he's somewhere in the Smoky Mountains probably right now. And um, so that was one piece of information. And then I was talking to a, a longtime client who lived in, uh, used to live in LA and he was moving his family to um, Florida. And he has two young children, you know, below the age of three. And he said, you know, I don't really feel like flying. This is someone who can afford to fly, okay? He's like, so I was either gonna charter a private plane or I'm just gonna rent an RV. And he rented an RV. And, and both of these things happened about six weeks ago. And I didn't do anything. I, I'm not a day trader. I don't make short term trades. So I don't, I don't care. I don't have any sense of regret here. I'm just saying like, pick your head up. If you are, if you want to do something like take a small amount of money and do these types of things, that's actually really indicative. It's not a data set. Okay. Two people is obviously not a data set. However, Two people that would never in the, a million years entertain taking an RV trip, who in a matter of 24 hours tell me they're taking an RV trip, that's more important than you think. Because there's a, there's a hell of a lot of people saying similar things and making similar decisions at the same point. I promise you that. And, and that's what happened. Literally, demand went through the roof. And so I think, you know, we, we take that, we, we pay attention to the number of units that, uh, you know, Thor Industries and Winnebago are, are selling. And it's not just sales, but, you know, it's hard to rent one right now. Well, what do you do with these? You, you don't buy an RV to park it out in front of your house. You buy it to take it somewhere. Where do you take it? A campground or an RV resort. Well, how do you get exposure to those through REITs? Well, through the manufactured home and RV resort REITs. I mean, there, there's, there's two of them that, you know, I'll mention, you know, off the top of my head, Sun Communities. We're, we're really fond of Sun Communities. They own manufactured at home uh, housing communities, both all age uh, and age restricted. And they also own RV resorts. Uh, they're in our growth block now. Another one, Equity Lifestyle Properties, ticker ELS. They own you know, almost the same type of property, manufactured housing communities and RV resorts. They've got campgrounds. They've got yurts. Uh, I mean, you, you name it, and they've got your outdoor travel. So it, yeah. it's definitely some ways to play this in the real estate. And, and Jeff, you were absolutely right in something else you said. Um, I talked to my partner, Michael, yesterday, and he said that, number one, all the campgrounds, because that is where you have to park RVs, right? He has a huge RV, completely packed. Um, it was really hard to get in them and find places to park. I mean, it, it's happened. I mean, th this is how people are vacationing this summer. Um, and even personally, um, I am going to Denver for a week at the end of June, early July. And my wife and I are literally having a conversation about what do we do? Do we fly? Do we drive? I'm not an RV. This would be pack up an SUV, right? Different acronym, but we haven't decided, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Is flying safe? I mean, maybe, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. So now you're doing the cost benefit, right? Do I want to sit in the car for 18 hours? Not really. Do I want to fly and be stressed out about it? Not really, right? All right, so let's, let's go on. Third theme, uh, I believe, was work from home. Work from home, that's, that's correct, right? Many of us have, have done this out of necessity, been forced to. Uh, some have done it uh, optionally, uh, but it, it's going to become more uh, prevalent. I think when people have been forced to do this for a few months and um, you know, supervisors or uh, you know, stakeholders see that, yeah, they can be just as, as productive, maybe even have a, a better life work balance, uh, it, it works. Uh, you know, are some of us gonna go back to the office? Yeah, absolutely, at, at some point. I'm kind of looking forward to, to going back myself. Will offices be eliminated entirely? Probably not. But I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, an example. About a month ago, I got a call from a, a good friend of mine. He works in downtown Chicago in the insurance industry. In the insurance industry. Um, he told me, you know what? They had just signed a new lease about a year and a half ago. And uh, over the course of this, uh, you know, lockdown in, in Illinois, um, the owners of the company decided to pay the termination fee. He's never going back to the office. They're work from home now and, and forever. Uh, and the owner of the company is actually saying it saved them a lot of money over the next uh, eight years, of the remaining lease term, 
and you know they'll find a you know one way to keep some of that themselves and another way to you know, shower some of it on, on their employees. Uh, but it, it, it's definitely things are going to be different now. At the conference, we heard some defiance from some of the office landlords, or they're not yet ready to acknowledge this. I mean, it's it's in their interest to say, yeah, sure, people want to come back to the office. Employees prefer to be there. This is all just temporary. You know, right now they're more concerned about. Uh, the cleaning and the processes of getting their building opening. How do we get everybody up in the escalator? Do we just have to sit at the door? And you know, it's like, yeah, great. You got long leases, but they're not forever leases. And I think when some of these tenants uh, review their space needs for the future or down the road, it may be less if they have less people in the office regularly, or maybe people are only coming in on a rotating basis, or maybe just once or twice a, a, a week. Um, it, it's, it's definitely something worth paying attention to. Um, I don't know, Dave, you're, you're, you're a business owner. How, how do you think about our space needs? I mean, we're still a growing company, but how do you think about our space needs? So, uh, I... First of all, we're, we're working really well remotely and the productivity has been the same. There's been no drop off at all. And so I think a lot of business owners would say similar things, right? So the substitute good for office is virtual office and, and that's been proven to be very effective. Um, however, Origin is also a, a very innovative company and innovation happens when you're sharing ideas constantly, right? And so the, the one thing that you lose at an innovation platform firm like Origin is um, all of the conversations that happen organically. They don't happen. You're not there, right? And so you can schedule a meeting and, and you can get innovation, but it's never organic. Like scheduling meeting by definition is not organic. It's, it was scheduled, right? Um, but I think net net, um, this is classic disruption. Right? Disruption generally happens with an inferior product that gets better and better and better and forces the premium product to also get better or all of a sudden it doesn't have any market. Right? A great example of that would be Apple. When Apple came out with its iPhone, it had, it had a camera. It wasn't very good, but it was good enough. And man, was it, it was really convenient because I didn't have to carry a camera. I could just carry the phone. And I didn't need a video camera anymore because it had video. It wasn't good. It was good enough. <laughs> but guess what happened every year? It got a little better, a little better, a little better. Well, how many video cameras do you see today? How many cameras do you see today? I mean, that's how disruption happens. In this case, virtual office is the inferior product that's disrupting the premium product, which is physical space. I would not want to own office long term. It's my opinion. I, I think that we're in the first inning of a long slide, you know, equivalent to 2004, you know, Amazon's just getting its feet under it and it's starting to disrupt retail. And it, man, it was always really expensive. Like, you know, it hurt to buy it. It's still only in the third or fourth inning, meaning Amazon, I mean, 85% of retail is brick and mortar. It won't be, you know, when, when our, when our parents are replaced by our kids as consumers, our kids, they won't even know what a store is, right? And, and I, I fear that office space is in the, in the same early phases of a, I don't think this is just coronavirus. I think it's much, it's secular, it's, it's enduring. And, and so as a business owner, you asked me that question, um, we'll use a hybrid model. Um, number one, because I wanna make sure people are you know, feeling safe and they won't be required to go back to work until they feel safe. How do you put a time on that, right? That could be August, if that's when people feel safe. That could be November, if that's when people feel safe. Um, and so, and by the way, that's, that's an easy decision to make when our teams are operating at such a high level, right? So then the flip side is we have really nice office space and we have a lot of it, right? You know, so it's not like we're, we're packed in. We have, you know, generally about 30 employees um, 30 team members and and we have about 8,000 square feet, right? So that's 260 square feet per person. So I would say that's about the right ratio um, to maybe at the higher end. So if I, you know, if 10 of those 30 people elect to use physical office space, 
well, what, look at my ratio now. Now I'm 800 square feet per, per user. Well, that's crazy, right? Why do I want to pay for that? I don't, right? So these are the things you're right when you mention um, long-term leases are nice, but what's going to happen when they expire, right? I mean, you have to pick your head up. Facebook, you know, their founder said um, he wants half of his, you know, office, half of his team to be virtual within five to 10 years. He's not kidding, right? He's dead serious. And, and as an office investor, you, you better be watching this stuff. Um, let's move on. Uh, I just popped up oh, a, few, a few articles here that, you know, mention those same things, right? Some companies are leading the work from home revolution. You know, Facebook's going to let some stay there uh, at home. Harvard Business Review article on the three behavioral trends that will reshape the post-COVID world. Number one was work from home. Uh, so you know, this is just all over the news. And I think we both agree that there's some definite warning signs coming out of, out of office. But you know, who benefits from that? We, we, sh we should mention that uh, as well. And, that, and that's the data center. And you know, we've talked a lot about the data centers before. We wrote an article. I mean, it was really on the preferred of, of QTS. Uh, but you know, we on the Path by Origin website, you know, you can download a whole article uh, about the business model and, and, and QTS. And it, it's these data centers are are really important. Look, we're doing this conference over, over Zoom. If we're having a meeting in in person, we wouldn't need this technology. Here, it's you and I talking, and hundreds of people at home all using this. this is all going through a data center with people working from home. Some have to use a VPN, a virtual private network that actually increases the network traffic because you're making an extra hop, one into your uh, company's network and then back out to the outside versus you know, straight through from, from your home uh, network. So it's the data centers are really uh, you know, set up to capture some of this long demand. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but moving on to item number four, and that is uh, you know, suburban flight. Uh, this is really, part of uh, comes out of the last one of working from home that you know one if people don't need to do a daily commute to the office and they can work anywhere or they've been cooped up in a one or two bedroom apartment for you know two three months now uh, they are definitely envying you know a four bedroom house in the suburbs uh, with, with a yard i don't need to go into the office or if i do i'm all right doing that commute uh once a week so we're definitely starting to see a pickup in demand uh, for single family rentals. Uh, these are you know, single family homes that are owned by REITs uh, and, and rented out. Uh, during this downturn, we've seen uh, kind of spot market price renting, uh, rents on, on apartments uh, drift down. The single family owners have actually increased rents these past few months. We're getting you know, more showings now I mean, just, just think, I'm, I know personally myself, I was there a few years ago with three small kids, uh, you know, off to move out to the suburbs or for, for nice schools. If you were still in the city and you were thinking about it, had, you know, small kids or kids on the way, uh, and maybe even had to live through some of these protests or riot recently, uh, a nice, quiet, single family home in the suburbs uh, would be a welcome sight. Some extra space, some good schools, uh, you know, work from home. So single family homes, like some of the REITs in that space, AMH, American Homes for Rent, you know, we own that in our growth block, uh, Invitation Homes, INVH, that's another one that has a, a, a platform of, of single family rentals. So uh, I, I definitely think we're going to see more uh, people move to the, to the suburbs, but you've also seen a slight pickup, uh, at least inquiries into suburban office where people may not have the full-blown offices downtown, but they need a satellite office for, for a small group of employees, whether it's co-working where they're just meeting every once in a while or just having a few people in there. Um, so you know, we, we've seen an increase in demand for some of that smaller mid-rise office. Uh, you know, it's not a lot of demand, but you know, at the margin, just a little bit more interesting than the CBD office at this point. Yeah. Totally agree on the home for rent strategy. Um, and, and what Jeff is talking about, there's two types of home to rent strategies. One is you just buy single family homes and rent them out. And there's publicly traded REITs to do that. And there's also um, purpose built communities that are now emerging. And this is a new business line where um, some of the home builders are doing it, um, but also some developers are doing it. 
And on the private side, um, my acquisition teams um, at Origin, we, we've been looking into this space for three or four years, and we've actually tried to invest in it in preferred equity positions um, a few times, and, and we were just outbid by um, other firms that had better terms, perhaps. But um, it's not a new thing. It's just it, it has this added, added tailwind right now um, where people are wanting more space. Um, and, and by the way, you know, the other thing that's going on, Jeff, is when people are less certain and less secure, they want to have a home, but they don't necessarily want to put a down payment down and, and, and really commit, right? So they're more apt to rent. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, that some of the home builders are you know, building communities now entirely for rent. AMH was partnering with some of them. Uh, they put some of these these projects on hold, you know, during the past few months. But they were I investing alongside some of these home builders in communities that are built from the ground right. up, look like single family homes, but they're one hundred percent rentals, and and they're built to be services rentals, to be a little bit yeah. more durable and have faster turnover. And, and oftentimes, what happens is um, a builder, a home builder, will come in and and they buy a big piece of land and they're going to build 200 homes on it but then they they've also become the master builder and they subdivide out a section that's going to be multifamily or in this case horizontal multifamily right that look like homes um, we're looking at a qoz deal um, in houston that has those characteristics but it's a mastered community it's all for sale product but then there's one site that's a multifamily site that we, we might wind up building that um, as a rental Right. So there's there's a lot of cross pollinization here. Right. And it's interesting because the the rental home, the build to rent home community strategy is kind of a hybrid. Right. It's not traditional multi. It's not for sale, but it's in between. And uh, there's demand for it. Um, all right. Uh, let's move on because I want to have at least 15 minutes to, to do our Q&A session. Um, okay. Let's talk retail. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, uh, this is this is not new. This is a trend that I think has been uh, accelerated during this pandemic, and, and we've caught whiffs of this. But retail is going to have to evolve uh, to survive. Uh, you know, you, you, everyone's probably heard that it takes 30 days to to create a new habit. Well, anyone that's been locked at home for you know 60 days now has formed new habits. How you're going to do, how you're do, done your shopping has changed, how you ordered goods has changed, and it's just going to going to change even more quickly. I'm putting up a little bit of humor here, but you know we all we all laugh at you know groceries delivered by uh, drones, but you know that was actually happening in in, in parts of uh, uh, the, in certain areas they were they were testing that. Uh, on the right, you see a, a picture of a of a beaten up mall. Where, you know we're probably going to see. Uh, more of these enclosed malls uh, shut down. Now this picture on the right, it's kind of ironic. Uh, this is Randall Park Mall in North Randall, uh, Ohio. Uh, when it opened in 1976, it was the largest shopping center in the, in the US. Uh, it actually shut down during the, the last uh, uh, the GFR, uh, but it has actually been torn down and Amazon has built a distribution facility in its place. So, uh, you know, how many malls get, you know, repurposed, whether it's repurposing the existing structure or whether it's completely tearing them down for something else, there, there's more of that to come. Uh, omnichannel, and if you're a retailer and you're not omnichannel, I don't know what you're doing at, at this point. People want to know what inventory you have in your stores. If they want a specific size, a specific color, they don't want to go to your store if you don't have it. They'll order on the, on the internet. Um, so you, inventory, supply chains, this is all going to need to, to be reworked. I think we saw some breakdowns in the, in the system uh, you know, during uh, you know, late March and, and April. And so you know, retail is just going to have to reconsider how it gets done how goods get moved around. Uh, it's not really profitable for Amazon to deliver things to your house. I know we were talking about Amazon as the big disruptor, uh, but you know maybe it's a surprise for some, but Amazon actually makes the, the bulk of their earnings uh, from Amazon Web Services, their data center business. Uh, so they've obviously disrupted, um, they've obviously disrupted retail, but they're also a leader in the, in the, in the data science space. So, uh, you know, Pay attention to uh, omni-channel uh, goods being delivered to the to the home. Industrial probably benefits from that. 
uh, companies like Prologis or Duke Realty Trust, DRE, we own Duke in our growth block, right? They own some of these uh, large um, e-commerce distribution centers that are only gonna become more and more important uh, as, as retail continues to, to evolve. We just have too much retail in the US. There's an astonishing amount of retail relative to Europe. I mean, I would consider Europe our closest comp, right? They're developed, westernized, mature economies. Um, what do we have? Triple the retail per capita it, they have? Yeah, I mean, two and a half or three times the square it, foot per, it per really person. Get, it's a lot. It gets scary when you start to think about how we have an overabundance of everything because we have really strong capital markets. People like to take risk here. And we're a consumption economy, right? So people wanted it, people got it. But now you have this secular shift where I can just tell you, my 12 year old son, his best night out is playing video games with his friends. You know, so the, he's, he's here and he's playing video games and he's talking to them on FaceTime at the same time. And so it's social and it's video. That to him is better than a movie theater. And, and so, you know, if you believe that experiential retail is the savior, um, I would question that. I'm not sure that 12, 15 year old kids agree with you and they're your big consumers in the next 10 years, right? By the way, a 12 year old kid, when I was 12, you didn't go to the movies, you went to the movies five times. Yeah. I watched Return of the Jedi five times in the theater because that's what you did. We didn't have video games. Right. Well, now they don't go at all. Very different. Um, all right. We're going to we're going to hit the questions. We have six questions. And if this isn't enough, I'm going to fire some at you. OK. So for people watching live, I really don't want uh, secular or big questions. Don't don't ask questions I can answer. I want in the weeds questions about stocks, um, because that's that's more interesting for Jeff, I think. All right, so I have one. Um, what do you think of TCO? It seems like SPG just wants to get out of a deal, regret, they're, they're regretting signing. Do you think there's a realistic legal case? So why don't you talk about the deal, the two yeah, stocks? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer. We, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so to, to, to try and handicap whether Simon, so here's the deal. Uh, Simon Property Group, SPG, has, has long made it known. Uh, they've made a play for Taubman once before. The state of Michigan had, had actually made some new laws uh, to help protect uh, the Taubman uh, owners, uh, Taubman domiciled in, in, in Michigan. Uh, so Simon, uh, they struck a deal. Simon was gonna uh, acquire uh, Taubman at, at, at a specific price in, in the 50s. That was a uh, pre-pandemic, pre the pandemic hit. And Simon's now saying that uh, Taubman didn't keep up their properties as well as other uh, real estate owners did. Uh, so they broke some, um, there was material breach of the contract and they went out of the deal. I mean, the, the news is, Simon is positioning for a better deal. They want to offer a haircut. Simon, that Simon still wants to get the deal done. Uh, they don't want this to drag out in the courts for a year. Can they get a 10, a 20, 25% price reduction? Can Simon get some better terms on, on the deal uh, since things have uh, you know, happened? Uh, that's kind of the, the word on the street is Simon's positioning for a better deal versus just flat out uh, walking away. Uh, so I, while this is- Is there a breakup that, fee, Jeff? There, I don't believe there was a breakup fee, but that's, that's one of the things being thrown around that if Simon does want to walk away, uh, maybe they will just offer a breakup fee, uh, but that they don't really want to walk away. They want to renegotiate the deal. Kind of yeah. yeah, I mean, look, it's funny because this happens in the private markets all the time, right? All the time. Deals get renegotiated, leverage, all these things. It doesn't happen in the public markets all the time though. And that's what's interesting here, um, that it's unfolding. Normally there are breakup fees and other things to prevent the buyer from doing these types of things. But you know, th this becomes a question about the, the selling firm. If they didn't put in a breakup fee, you as a shareholder have to ask why. Like, why why didn't you right? yeah and i mean there may be a breakup fee but simon's arguing that because of the material breach of contract they, they don't have to pay mm -hmm. it 
uh, it, there's this this saga, this drama is is going to be ongoing, and it's going to provide some uh, welcome re, re, re relief news over, over the summer. Sure. So we got a lot of new questions in. So thank you very much for um, listening. These are all exactly the types of questions I want to ask Jeff. Um, so this particular question: um, What's your view on American Tower? Um, is it overpriced based on how much it's rallied? And are all the trends that you're talking about already priced in? Great question. Yeah. So American Tower. Yeah. No. I mean, the the, the tower companies. All you know, all three of them: AMT, Crown Castle, and SBAC. Yeah. Hey, they're they're all richly priced. Uh, but you know, they have they still have growth. A lot of the activity for for this year. This is pre pre COVID. Was really planned for the back half of the year. I mean, the big news in the tower space was they just had to get through the Sprint T-Mobile merger. While well, that kind of hung in the, in the DOG and the court system, people just weren't sure. And, and knowing that that was getting wrapped up early this year meant that all the activity for them was, was going to be late in, in the year. Um, so there is a lot of, in the U.S., domestic uh, happenings. Uh, the carriers need to put more equipment out there. And you know, surprise, actually most of the equipment they're putting out there now is to, to further coverage of 4G. Uh, and they're just getting started with the, with the 5G rollout. Now, AMT versus, versus Crown Castle, one, one of my concerns with AMT is they do have a lot of international exposure. In some of these less developed markets, uh, you know, maybe India, you still have carrier consolidation uh, going on, you know, where in the U.S. is, you know, we're, we're really down to three, maybe four if, if DISH gets going. Uh, but you have many more carriers in some of these less developed uh, uh, markets. So um, any, I, I think the good, I think the backdrop is set well for AMT. Personally, I prefer Crown Castle, uh, but it's the international exposure of AMT. Uh, the, I'll, I'll be honest, I've been wrong. The international stuff's been growing faster than the than the U.S. stuff, right? In some of these places, they're not rolling out 4G or 5G. They're still working on getting 3G fully up and, and running. So they've got some long room ahead of them. Uh, but it's the international exposure that just gives me a tilt of caution on AMT. Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, mall REITs. Which mall REITs do you see surviving the retail crunch? And I'll just add on, it is, at these valuations, does it make sense? to take a unit of risk on a, on a strong balance sheet, strong management team, mall REIT? So I'll give you, uh, you know, two of them and they're gonna be at opposite ends of the spectrum, right? We, we've mentioned Simon Property Groups, you know, one walking away from uh, the, trying to walk away from the, the Taubman merger. Also been in the news recently for pursuing the, the GAP. Uh, GAP National Retailer didn't pay uh, some, some rent. So Simon's found themselves in the news. You know, Simon is the largest mall company, by far uh, the best balance sheet. Uh, Simon will be around after coronavirus. Simon will be around in a few years. Uh, they're almost the only investable mall REIT at, at, at this point. On the other end of the spectrum, you have CBL. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned this to date, but CBL missed a bond payment, uh, I think it was late, late May. Um, they, there, maybe it was earlier this month, but they missed a bond payment. They have a 28 or 30 day grace period. We're, we're down to like three weeks. Um, if they don't get some sort of agreement wo worked out with those bondholders, they'll be put in default. They'll be bankrupt. So, I mean, you have here a U.S. mall rate on the verge of bankruptcy. We will know something within the next three or four weeks, whether CBL, you know, common equity is, is, is even around. So I would really caution you against trying to, to play in the, the, the B ball space. Um, Simon will definitely be around. Uh, Talman has some leverage issues. They by far have the best mall uh, portfolio. They probably can find a, a, a way to survive. I'm not saying they'll thrive, but a way to survive. Um, the other BMAW players, forget about them. And then you have Mace Rich. Mace Rich too has some higher leverages. Their ticker's MAC. They're kind of on the cusp. I mean, that, that's, I would probably say if I, I Drew a line, I would say Simon, Talman, and Maestris survive. The other ones either either get acquired at a you know rock bottom price or just slowly die off. All right, we have a ton of questions now. Everyone, everyone woke up and decided they like putting you on the spot. So um, you have to do it quicker. Okay. I'll do it quicker. All right. all these. Um, 
same question office reads um what's what's your what's your favorites going forward and the question is do you think um there's going to be trouble going forward um, yeah, there, I mean, there, there, there could be, it's going to take a long time to see how these things actually play off. And then who actually suffered? Is it the newest office building with the most modern features that, that are still in demand? Or is it those class B buildings that were obsolete, you know, already, you know, five, 10 years ago, uh, that, you know, just need to be, to be repurposed. So I think you still see, you know, in, in businesses similar to ours, but, you know, technology, there's still this, this inclination to have people together uh, to be working in groups. So I think if the office uh, has exposure to, to technology tenants, and I, I know we're talking about Facebook working from home, but if you're really, you're developing some stuff or needing to whiteboard stuff out, there's, there's still a lot of demand for uh, uh, tech space. If you have media space, here's one that I kind of like, Hudson Pacific Properties. Why? They got a whole bunch of leases in Hollywood with Netflix. What have the people been doing over this, this lockdown? And what will they continue to be do it using is Netflix. And Netflix has to keep continuing new content. Um, so Hudson Pacific has some of their office buildings. Netflix has studio space, post-production space. Uh, a lot of the space needed to make these uh, you know, Netflix series a, a, a reality. So if you've got you know, content providers that are used in your space, that, that's a benefit. Um, so I, I would just, I would be a little cautious of the, the fungible, uh, the fungible office with, you know, B markets and B balance sheets and B management teams. They just seem like they'll go by the, by the wayside. I'm still a fan of Boston properties. Yes, it's high rise uh, office buildings in, in uh, gateway city markets. Uh, but, you know, they've got a great management team, a great balance sheet, and uh, some great developments in the pipeline. Question on healthcare REITs. Um, the question is, which healthcare REITs survive? Um, I would just add, which ones do you feel strongest about? Management teams, balance sheets, positioning, assets? Um, yeah, so we're a little cautious on, on, on senior housing. Uh, the occupancy there has been, been dropping off. You know, one that we do like is Health Peak, ticker P-E-A-K. Yes, they do have exposure to uh, senior housing, but they've also got uh, about 30% of their portfolio in life science base. We did a, a, a webinar and I think an article that you can see on origin, uh, pathbyorigin.com that talks about lab space. So some of the REITs in medical office own uh, lab space. Uh, the medical office buildings, you know, they seem to be doing fine. Uh, most of the hospital systems, they're starting to get funding. It's, it, it's kind of weird that the, the biggest hospital systems seem to get more of the, the, the funding than some of the smaller ones. But we have seen um, some of these doctor's offices and hospitals start to reopen and elective surgeries uh, going on again. But I mean, I guess if I left you with one, it, it, it's peak. We like health peak. What's your view on CXW or GEO? <laughs> Um, it's funny, Jeff and I were literally talking about this earlier today. Um, these are uh, real estate, uh, it's real estate, but it's, it's prisons. Um, and so again, it's not a political issue here. This is an investment conversation. Um, and I know, you know, I know you know a lot about them, Jeff, so. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, the prison rates, I, you know, uh, of the two, I like Geo Group a little bit better than Core Civic. You know, this is at the margin. They've obviously had a, a, a tough time through this, this pandemic. Uh, we could sit here and debate the, the social issues uh, all day long. I mean, I think one thing important to, to watch here is the, the November uh, election. Um, I think the worst case scenario, which would have been a President Warren for these prison reads, that seems like that's off the table. If she's the vice presidential nominee, maybe that's uh, bad for them too, but who actually wins the, the election? Uh, if Trump uh, uh, wins again and stays in office, I think you will see both these prison reads have significant rallies. Uh, a Democratic president with a completely controlled Democratic Congress, uh, I would be rather bearish on these stocks. Um, I'll answer one. Uh, the question is, do you, do you see apartment reads surviving? Um, the answer is, of course. Uh, I, you know, we own uh, 5,000 units on the private side and 
that's actually doing quite well in terms of operations. Um, I also think longer term cap rates have a better chance of going down than up. Um, when the Federal Reserve is talking about two and a half years of zero percent interest rates, um, and there's going to be probably $10 trillion, but maybe more slushing around the economy. Um, that's my opinion. I, I actually think that apartments are going to do very, very well. Um, that said, um, you asked a question about apartment REITs, right? And so the answer is it depends. Um, there are certain apartment REITs that used way too much leverage. And, and the, the way that they did that is they levered both at the property level and the company level. And so if you look at the company level, there's not a lot, a lot of debt. And if you look at the property level, there's not a lot of debt. But you look at both, there's a lot of debt, right? So this is where, Jeff, you know, you, you could break these down, all, all 10 to 20 of them. And I really don't want to hold, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a few, and you know, we've discussed them. I really don't want to publicly talk about this stuff um, today. But I would say that for investors, before you buy any investment, certainly now, um, take a hard look at their balance sheet. And if you don't understand how to do that, um, firms like ours do. Um, and these things matter. Um, some of the apartment REITs you're buying are not what you think. Um, I'm going to keep going. Um, given where you're seeing private multifamily deals get done, would you say it's cheaper to buy multifamily REITs or apartment buildings directly? Um, I'll take this, very, I'll be very brief. Uh, it's, it's really hard to get a multifamily private deal done um, in less than 60 to 90 days, right? So you can buy a publicly traded stock today, right? Right now, this second. Um, it doesn't work that way on the private side. Um, before, and I don't even know where the market is right now. It was down four to 5% when this started today. Is that where it is still? Um, you got Bloomberg up? Yeah, so uh, Dow's down, you know, Dow's down 6%, S&P down oh. almost five and a half. Okay, so it's on, they're on their lows, right? So, so you've had this massive run up all the way to, you know, 3,200 and, and beyond in the S&P um, that really felt almost like a 50% rally off the bottom. I think the bottom was 2,200. I mean, you're getting really close to a 50% rally and so today's scary but i mean it was up eight nine hundred on friday and no one was questioning that right so it's very volatile right now um but the bottom line is apartment reits are probably down it depends on the reit but i would say after today 25 percent from their highs right um that implies generally an asset level um correction of about 10%, um, depending on if it was trading above or below NAV um, to the stock's price, you know, when it started. Um, so let's just assume it's 10. Um, I'm seeing in the private markets, um, because we, we track thousands of transactions and we own, in the private markets, um, I'm seeing anywhere from, you know, unchanged in valuation to maybe down five, six, seven percent on stuff that's actually trading. Um, still. And, and remember, it takes 60 to 90 days. So there's not a lot that's actually traded post COVID. But I have seen a lot of things fall out. Um, it's kind of interesting because you're seeing in the public markets with Simon Property Group, but this is happening in the private markets all the time, right? This notion of people wanting to retrade, right? Mm -hmm. They want a better price um, than they did in, in March. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, um, public markets show you direction but they tend to overshoot where the private market ever goes, right? So if, if the public market's down 25, it's, it's indicative. Again, 25 isn't 25 because publicly traded REITs use debt and equity. So you really have to value just the equity portion, which is not the whole asset. It tends to be about half of the asset. So my point is it'll show you direction, but it won't show you the scale of the private market correction. So to answer your question, what's better? It's such a hard question because there's so many variables, right? Like, what's the asset like? What's the future um, appreciation like of the asset? I would have to see the actual deal to, to make a, a determination of that. Um, it's a good question, uh, but it's not clear right now is the answer. Um, you can always hedge your bet and own a little of both. 
Yeah, and, and that's what we do, you know, and we haven't really talked about that much. We should do a whole show on that, actually, because um, it's really important for people to be both in public REITs and private real estate. Um, there's a sort of optimal frontier where you get the high expected returns, but also the lowest standard deviation or the lowest risk if you're in both. Um, and obviously, publicly traded REITs provide liquidity. And private investments simply do not. So you, you need to have both. Um, and I, I've personally been investing um, much more heavily on the public side, as you've seen, Jeff, um, over the last you know, six months. Um, OK, I think that's it. We're out of time. Um, there were some questions we didn't get to, but I did get to all the individual stock questions. So thanks for sending those in. Um, Thanks for your time again, everyone. Your feedback is valued. So um, if you have feedback to share, please do it. Um, for example, if you like this last section where we discuss stocks um, sort of back and forth with the audience, we can make that half the show, right? I mean, so, so if we get enough positive feedback or negative, you know, we'll, we'll be malleable that way. Um, thank you again for your time, Jeff. Appreciate it. And uh, we will see everyone again next month. Be safe.